Hello, and welcome to another uproarious episode of What Happened, the show where- Hey, no, what the hell, Matt, you shout at your screen. Kingdoms of Amalur is a great game and doesn't belong on this show, you continue to exclaim, your eyes frantically darting to the title of this video, okay? Okay, look, let's talk. One thing I've tried to remain consistent on in regards to what happened is to use general terms to describe the subject matter, stuff like disasters or catastrophes or catastroasters. But one thing I at least try to avoid saying is straight up bad games. With that being said, it just so happens that the vast majority of games I've covered happen to be, yeah, bad games or, you know, at least divisive ones. But in the case of Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning, yeah, most people agree it's a solid action RPG. But this story isn't about the game's expansive lore, gameplay, or characters. This is about the monumental failure and ambition of 38 Studios, the state of Rhode Island, and an old baseball man. Reckoning was set up to be this massive new mythology akin to the works of J.R.R. Tolkien, was spearheaded by a veritable who's who of creative talent, and was going to establish a fledgling first-time company as the nucleus of a dynamic new entertainment mecca. So what happened? Our tale dates back to the forgotten age veiled in the mists of time, an elusive and regal sliver of antiquity known as, as 2006. Longtime game developer and entrepreneur Kurt Schilling, who helmed such projects as, uh, being a baseball pitcher, uh, I, so I guess he's not a game developer, uh, decided to open his own company called Green Monster Games in Maynard, Massachusetts, with the goal of not just making their own titles, but developing brands and IPs to spin off into other forms of media, an incredibly lofty and ambitious goal for a brand new game company that almost never ever works. However, much like building a soccer or basketball squad or whatever, Mr. Schilling decided to build an all-star team of talent to work on its first big IP, a fantasy-based mythology known as the Kingdoms of Amalur. He brought on a variety of business types to handle the business stuff, but more notably, a bevy of creative minds, the most prolific being fantasy author R.A. Salvatore, who would craft much of the ideas behind the story and the lore. Following that, much like how Peter Jackson hired famed Lord of the Rings artists such as Alan Lee and John Howe, Kurt Schilling sought the talents of someone of comparable skill that of course being, wait what? No. Uh, Todd McFarlane, is that right? That's... That's not a typo? Oh, okay. During an interview, Mr. Schilling was asked about this unique approach to team building, saying, If I was going to create the funnest, coolest, and best game I could, who would I want from a creative standpoint? At the top of my list were <laughs> Todd McFarlane and R.A. Salvatore, and it's a dream come true that they have agreed to join Green Monster Games in the production of our first title. I mean, alright, all that seems odd, but cool, lots of swagger there, but let's keep in mind. Hiring a big cool artist or writer can be a boon to your project, but it's also another thing. Expensive. This will be a running theme throughout the mismanagement of 38 Studios. Wait, 38 Studios? Oh, right. For whatever reason, Kurt Schilling changed the name of his company the following year. But why 38? Well, because it was the number he wore on his hockey jersey for his entire career. Throughout the next year or two, a lot of noise was made about this seemingly too large to fail venture. Lots more big wigs were hired, including one Brett Close as CEO. He loved to cut promos about how much ass 38 Studios was kicking, despite, you know, you know, not having anything to show yet. Everybody likes to come out and say, we're going to be the best at something. We're just, we're just going to be great. Trust us. The name 38 Studios captures the scope of our goals. Our mission is to create groundbreaking intellectual properties that inspire a vast selection of entertainment experiences. 
the pillar of this vast selection of entertainment experiences was going to be something called Copernicus, a massively multiplayer online experience set within the Amalur universe that, again, was a very ambitious project to make your first. However, the solution to that was simple. 38 Studios would just spend more and more money to hire outside talent to get them there. Enter Travis McGeefy, lead designer on EverQuest, famed musical genius Aubrey Hodges, and user interface director Irina Pereira, who had previously led on World of Warcraft. Now, with all these megastars working together, how could this possibly fail? Let's find out. In May of 2009, after three years of not shipping a single project, 38 Studios announced they had purchased Big Huge games from THQ for an undisclosed sum. Big Huge was a relatively new developer that had sired the Rise of Nations franchise and had been prototyping their own RPG concept dubbed Project Mercury when the acquisition was made. Now, since very little tangible progress had been made on Copernicus, 38 Studios made it known that Big Huge Games would be critical in getting that out the door. However, a year later, in 2010, internally, the decision was made to simply take Project Mercury and to shoehorn the Amalur name and world into it, which would still be a more time-saving and cost-effective alternative than trying to make Copernicus a thing. This was followed up by announcing that EA would then publish this new title, the newly dubbed Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning, and would ship on the PS3, the Xbox 360, and Windows. So the plan to start off with an incredibly ambitious MMO was changed to develop a more manageable single-player action RPG with an open-world structure. This is a good decision, but one that came about four years too late, when you consider that all the work done on Copernicus up until that point was shelved, with a lot of those aforementioned superstars moving on to other projects, with only R.A. Salvatore and famed fantasy artist... Todd McFarlane remaining. Are, are, are we sure that's right? Anyway, so now we have 38 studios who I, I don't even know what they did at this point. Big, huge games and electronic arts all chomping on that Amalur pie. Uh, so why not invite another player to the party? And when I say player, I mean a whole goddamn state. A bit later, in the summer of 2010, former badminton star Kurt Schilling was approached by then Rhode Island Governor Donald Carcieri at a fundraiser, who was looking to inject money and jobs into his jurisdiction. At the time, lots of other states had developed successful clusters of game studios, mostly due to tax breaks and an available pool of talent, and Rhode Island wanted to be next in line, by any means necessary. While things seemed to be going well on the surface at 38, Kurt Schilling had already spent close to $40 million of his own money, but had no product to show for it. His pockets were not infinite, so he signed a deal with the state of Rhode Island bad move. Buddy Austin, at some point when this game ships and when this company takes its next step, people are going to recognize us as an absolute force. In exchange for a $75 million loan, his company would need to relocate from Boston to Rhode Island and generate 450 jobs over the course of three years. Much like the deal that was struck between Activision and Bizarre Creations, which you can see in my Gone Too Soon video, only $51 million of that 75 would be paid up front, with the rest dependent on those hiring milestones that 38 Studios would have to fill. They would also need to pay back a multitude of other fees in and around those same milestones. And finally, there was something called success fees, where 38 Studios would be expected to pay back 15 to 18 million dollars to Rhode Island once Amalur became a major success. It was not a major success. Now, remember, we're not talking about the game itself here, because once it was formally announced in 2010, it released two years later to positive reviews and no real bumps along the way, at least that we're aware of. There was some blowback back to the Day One DLC that the game had available that Kurt Schilling wrote off as rewards for early adopters. This DLC was locked behind a free online pass that was only included with new copies of the game. Therefore, if you bought it secondhand, you'd have to then purchase the pass to enjoy the DLC. 
Still though, this type of practice was popping up all over and it wasn't exclusive to Amalur. Which was the style at the time? Getting back to the game's actual success though, or lack thereof, is kind of murky, as there really isn't one singular thing you can point to, but a whole lot of little things that were working against it. 38 studios and big huge games were not household names like say Bioware or Bungie, they were unproven and were spearheading a brand new fantasy world. While names like R.A. Salvatore and Toddy McSpawnspawn were gets, they didn't mean a whole bunch to video game players per se, unless you are a fan of Necrid, of course. Amalur's gameplay loop was also not the most conventional, as it was an open world RPG, but featured combat heavily inspired by the likes of hack and slash action games, and lacked the more menu based systems and stats most role playing fans were accustomed to. Competition might have also played a factor, as February 2012 also saw the launch of The Darkness 2, Asura's Wrath, a brand new twist in metal, and the launch of the PS Vita, all in the span of two weeks. Hardly the best place to squeeze a brand new IP in. That being said, however, Reckoning did manage to shift 1.2 million units in the first 90 days on the market, which is actually a great number considering it wasn't a big sequel or known brand. However, remember about 8 minutes ago when I said, 38 studios would just spend more and more money? This is where that comes into play. It was estimated by Rhode Island that the game needed to shift around 3 million units to be profitable when compared to how much money was sunk into it. Not only that, but 38 Studios' own liquid assets were low due to how much Kurt Schilling had wasted during the first four years of the studio's existence. Once the game was out, he was then expected to make the first large payment owed to the state, about $1.1 million, but had to admit to the board of directors that would not be possible. They simply didn't have the money to pay back with. In fact, they had so little green on hand that employees at both 38 and Big Huge Games would go without paychecks that month. This was also bad news for any future projects, including Copernicus, which was to resume development off the back of Amalur's assured success, as well as a proposed sequel to Amalur. Yes, they were already prototyping for a follow-up before their initial game even hit store shelves. What did Kurt Schilling have to say about all this at the time? To all the prayers and well wishes to the team and families at 38, God bless and thank you. We will find a way and the strength to endure. They did none of those things. With no way to pay back all the money they owed the state, 38 Studios closed down, everyone at Big Huge Games was fired, and Rhode Island had to tell its taxpayers, who had partially funded the $75 million loan that powered all this, uh, wh whoops, I, I, guess, uh, I guess that didn't work out all well. When asked why so much rampant spending went on unchecked at 38 Studios, and why the state didn't interfere earlier, the then new governor of Rhode Island, one Lincoln Chaffee stated, I didn't meddle, but if I did meddle, then there wouldn't be all this violence, all this horrible sexism in games. Uh, sir, th th this is a Wendy's. Anyway, during the winding down of this massive monetary maelstrom, with everyone running around looking for answers, it was clear the government was not the typical partner you'd team up with to fund a video game. This is encapsulated perfectly by the criminal investigation that was immediately launched following Reckoning's lukewarm sales numbers. Uh, uh, video games? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know about this. I, I was I should wait. No, these video game people might be criminals. Let's let's get to the bottom of this. For four years, Rhode Island authorities conducted an exhaustive investigation into 38 Studios and their conduct, trying desperately to find some proof that the state had been hoodwinked. Then finally, in 2016, they confidently concluded, a bad deal doesn't always equate to an indictment, stated a Rhode Island police superintendent. They found zero evidence of any criminality on 38 Studios' part, but rather it just being a case of everyone being idiots. So where are they now? Well, the white-hot Kingdom of Amalur IP was picked up by THQ Nordic for 
some reason back in September of 2018, but no concrete details have surfaced other than the addition of backwards compatibility on the Xbox One. THQ Nordic did mention, however, that EA would need to give the go-ahead for a full re-release or remaster of the original game as they currently still maintain the rights for it. EA, for their part, has remained silent on the subject, having wiped their hands of the whole affair some time ago. Lincoln Chaffee, who succeeded Don Carcieri, that original governor who put this whole dumb plan into motion, ended his term in 2015, and was one of the main board members who was always against the investment in the first place. Chaffee's public statements labeling the game as a commercial failure was cited by Kurt Schilling as the reason why EA pulled out of the franchise as well as funding a sequel. EA, again wanting to distance themselves from all the drama, never confirmed this in any official capacity. Now, speaking of Kurt Schilling, as many would correctly assume, stepped away from game development or entertainment media IP bullshit development and was hired by ESPN as an analyst until, of course, he got suspended multiple times and eventually fired for a series of yikes social media posts in early 2016. And there you have it. Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning, a good, solid action RPG soured by idiotic management, millions of wasted dollars, and sky-high ambitions and expectations. It's the first of its kind chronicled here on what happened, but it certainly won't be the last. Thanks again to those of you on the Flophouse VIP Patreon for voting for this game, and stay tuned for the next official poll where we'll assuredly dig into another giant catastro disaster.